Hey there, I'm Joshua Sheehan. Welcome to the RV Entrepreneur Podcast. The RV Entrepreneur is a community for RVers that are exploring ways to financially support themselves while living their RV life. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Michael Boink. Michael Boink is an award-winning writer and photographer who works as a managing editor for a global software consulting and implementation company. He's been on the podcast several times before discussing various topics. Michael, his wife Carissa, and their two children spent eight years traveling the U.S. in an RV while continuing to work and homeschool. While on the road, Michael and Carissa ran DitchingSuburbia.com, a website that provided resources, guides, and community for traveling families. Their story was covered by the Huffington Post, the Seattle Times, Las Vegas Guardian, Art of Nonconformity, Tiny House Magazine, and many other travel-related blogs and podcasts. The Boinks are now homeowners in rural Missouri, where they continue to look for new ways to scratch the incurable condition known as Hitch Itch. Michael has just published his latest book, Driven to Wonder, about their travels as a full-time family and the struggles of content creation, including the burnout that he experienced and his way back to creating. Michael has a full circle picture from getting on the road, being on the road, to getting off the road. He has tons of insights to share with those of us that are currently on the journey with our families. And I'm excited for you guys to hear this conversation because seeing the end of the picture, the end of the circle, is super important for planning our futures. Before we jump into the interview, let's take a moment to thank the sponsors that make this podcast possible. The RV Entrepreneur Podcast is brought to you in part by RV Life Pro. Perfect for every RVer, you can plan your camping trips with the RV Life Trip Wizard, then use the RV Safe Navigation with the RV Life GPS and Campgrounds app. Both are included with RV Life Pro. Eliminate RV anxiety by knowing exactly where you'll camp, get fuel, and even grab lunch before you hit the road. RV Life has every campground, RV park, state park, and national park to fit your style. Plan your entire RV adventure, including fuel stops, rest areas, shopping, and entertainment. Go to RVLife.com and start your free 7-day trial, or download the RV Life app from the App Store. Travel dreams made simple with RV Life. Now, let's jump into the interview. Michael, welcome back to the RV Entrepreneur Podcast. You were a very early guest on the podcast with Heath, almost episode, I believe it was 25 is what I looked up when I re-listened to the episode. And back then you were talking about your work camping experience and the website you and your wife had created, Ditching Suburbia. Yeah. We've got you back on the podcast now to talk about your latest venture. For those who did not hear that previous episode, don't know anything about you, give me a brief rundown of who Michael is what you've been doing, and then also what you've just finished that we've got you on the podcast for. Sure. My wife and two kids, we got into an RV and hit the road in September of 2010 on what was to be a one-year family homeschooling adventure. And eight years later, we finally hung up the keys and got off the road. (laughs) And during that time, yeah, we were on the podcast to talk. We had done some work camping, and I believe we were on a second time, maybe talking about woofing or something different. But during that time, our business that we'd launched on kind of pivoted. So we had to do some reshuffling to get income coming back in. Even from from an entrepreneurial perspective, it was an interesting journey. Now, so you got off the road, let's see, that would have been 2018, 2019-ish? Yep. And at that point... Your kids are grown and out of the house? Actually, my son had left a couple of years earlier. He pretty much turned 18 and said, I want to get my one out. So we launched him while we were still in the RV yet. And then my daughter hung on a little longer and was kind of got off the road with us. Okay. So I'm interested to talk to you now, having gone through eight-year iteration of full-time RVing, traveling, homeschooling, and then going back to Sticks and Bricks and kind of I think a lot of people get into full-time RVing and RV entrepreneurship, maybe not looking down the road a decade. They think that, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this for a long time. There are very few people that I've met that make it a 10, 20, 30 year decade experience of living full-time on the road, especially starting as early as you did with kids. Talk to me about the transition. What did it feel like And maybe this is something that you cover in the book and we can jump that in as well. But what did it feel like to get off the road, knowing that the season of life changed, your requirements and your desires changed? Did it feel like you were quitting something or did it feel like you were just changing seasons and moving into something new and better for that specific season? Talk to me about what it felt like, I guess, to go from one adventure to another. It was kind of all of the above. So you're right in that people, I think, don't really 
think about the end game and we can talk about it later, but I think there's a kind of a four to five year lifespan for a lot of people. I do it with kids anyway. So what happened with us was my son was out. My daughter was with us. Kind of a number of factors came together all at one time. My daughter was expect- expressing interest in moving out, which meant this whole platform that we had built around being family RVers, it was suddenly we were going to be empty nesters and that was kind of a different market and a different feel. Mm-hmm. And personally for me at the time I was running a content studio. So we were generating content for clients. I was working on a different book that I have since abandoned, but it was going to be the ditching suburbia book. And so I was doing a lot of research and interviews for that. And we were trying to kind of grow the ditching suburbia brand. We were trying to become RV influencers and grow our social media following and all of that. And essentially what happened was I burned out. I really just overextended myself and basically put my personal health and my marriage at risk. And we, so we had to make a change and pretty much that change was we need to stop and just kind of sit down maybe for a while. Maybe it's a two month thing or a one year thing, but we need to lighten our load and kind of reassess where we're at in life. So I ended up taking a long sabbatical and basically got offline for a number of months and just kind of isolated myself and just a long kind of healing period. Looking back, having gone through that experience, I know there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are interested in building the exact same things that you built. What advice would you give to avoid the burnout, to not get to that point of needing to check out and go on a sabbatical? I guess just do less. I don't know. It's hard to know other than finding other people to help you, which I had my wife doing a lot of it as much as I could offload to her. We have that happening too. Probably trying to do the book and grow the website and everything at the same time was just too much. And mm-hmm. just realistically to do that and run a business and travel full time, it's just too much to cram into one life. So what made you go back to writing and decide to take your eight years of travel on the road with your family and turn it into a new book? Well, part of it's just, you know, I'm a writer and writers got to write. Well, there's a lot of that there. I'd, writing is the way I process things. So even to get to the point of understanding what had happened, why did we have to get off the road? What was this burnout thing all about? I needed to kind of write my way through that. And so there was that. There was wanting to document it for my kids and hopefully future grandkids. And when we were looking to get on the road, I'm just, I'm a researcher by nature. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to go just plumb the depths of the internet and find out if anyone else has done it and what happened to them. And I could never find many stories for people who had gotten off the road. I mean, a lot of families and full-time travelers, they start in the excitement, they start a blog. It's very exciting to blog through getting rid of your house and buying the RV and getting on the road. And then a lot of them find out that blogging is actually really hard work Mm -hmm. and they kind of peter out somewhere in there. And even the good ones who blog reliably while they're traveling, a lot of times they'll go back and the last blog entry will be 18 months ago. It was a travel blog, some new place, but then it's been 18 months and there's no new updates. And I think what happens was for some reason they've gotten off the road or stopped down from traveling. And that just doesn't seem, it seems like failure. It seems like it's not as exciting to write about. And so the blog doesn't get updated with that story. So I wanted to be able to tell the complete story in one kind of capsule. So the book starts with us. Why did we get on the road? Why did we start traveling? It ends with why did we get off the road? And what's it been like now that after eight years of traveling full time, what's it like to not travel? Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of that, it's just a bunch of stories of things, different things that happened to us on the road, different people we met. Just It's not a beginning to end narrative of our trip. It's more like a collection of related stories. Okay. Were these stories things that you had taken notes on or wrote about while they were happening, or is it all from memory? Kind of both. So we, I mean, we were pretty reliable bloggers throughout our travels. And so there was often when I I was thinking back on a certain experience, I would go back and reread our blog posts about it. And then a lot of it for me is taking pictures. So I think I took over 15,000 pictures during those eight years. And the pictures really bring back the experience for me. So I would go back to my photo library and just go, oh, that's right. You know, there's these these different things that we saw. So that was kind of the way I would put it back together. But, you know, most of the book, there are a few chapters that I, I grabbed from our blog and touched them up and put them in the book. But for the most part, it's written retrospectively, I call it. It's looking back. It is a memoir. Mm-hmm. So 15,000 pictures, that's just a snapshot of the memories from eight to 10 years of your life. 
Yeah. How do you go about distilling down which of the stories and which of the experiences, because it's your life, right? It's all relevant right. and it all gets you from right. point A to point B. You wouldn't be where you are today if all those things didn't happen in the order they happened, but you can't put that all into a book. So right. what was your process of deciding what would go in and what would get cut to the cutting room floor? Yeah, it was largely, I kind of committed to myself, I'm going to do a chapter a week. And so I would, basically I would sit down and start with the pictures. Like the vision I had for this book was it's got to be words and pictures. And so I need to make sure I've got good pictures for a location to, to go with the story. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of, do I have good photos? And then at that location, is there more than just, I didn't want the book just to be a collection of travel blogs. Hey, we, you know, we went to Austin and we saw the bats and we visited the Stevie Ray Vaughan statue and we ate street food and it was really cool. Like that gets old after a while. I mean, if you're out traveling, that may be a value, but that wasn't, that wasn't the value I wanted to put in the book. I wanted to look for places where we learned something or where we got challenged or where we met a cool person. Did we overcome a fear in a certain spot or people have fears when they get on the road? Am I going to break down? Am I going to run out of money? And you know, we, we kind of had both those things happen to us. So how can mm -hmm. I write about that now in a way that encourages people? I think this book is super timely in that we've seen such an uptake of people getting on the road with COVID allowing and forcing folks to be remote workers. Companies are saying, okay, come back into the office. And folks are saying, nope, I'm not coming back. So you either need right. to figure out a way for me to do this remotely, or I'm going to go find something else to do, yeah. which has led to a lot more people getting on the road. And now with all the internet solutions out there, getting connected to do that remote work is getting easier and easier seemingly by the week. And so it's timely that this book comes out now because I think it's super important to show the entire picture. So I want to go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned you think there's a lifespan of the average full-timer that goes more than the year-long road trip of having a lifespan yeah. of around five years. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, and I would qualify that by saying that's for families and that it's completely subjective, non-research based. But if I, you know, we when we ran Ditching Suburbia, one of the things that we did was we tracked the active bloggers out there. So we wanted to always have a list of here are the blogs that are by families who are currently updating their blog. And so by that watching that- sounds like that, a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah, it was. We updated it like probably weekly because, you know, the number of new people showing up and then the number of people dropping off. And we had to figure out, is there a grace period? And do we keep watching a blog even if it's gone dormant for a couple months? But by watching that, and then also like if I go back now and look for the people that we met while we were traveling- for the most part, their blogs have gone silent and their social accounts have gone silent. So I can't always verify that they're off the road, but I think they are. And so that just kind of add all that up. And I'm, it feels like kind of a college experience. You know, we were the class of what, 2018 or whatever. We, mm -hmm. we put in our years and then kind of graduated. Now there's a new class of people kind of coming into the lifestyle, figuring it out on the front end of things again. Knowing what you know now and being able to look back at all that data, What's your opinion on creating a lifestyle brand that's a bit more general to your family? Something that you could have the Boink Family Adventures and it would allow you to be not full-time travelers, but continue to do content right. creation for whatever your new adventure is. I see a lot of people coming into specifically the RV space and they'll add travels or RV or whatever to their brand name. And I think it, it again, it, like you said, it will tie you in. When you change that, yeah. it's harder to pivot when that's part of your brand, right? would you go back and advise someone to, to make something a bit more general, even though it'll be harder in the beginning because you don't have that search engine optimization with keywords? Yeah, I guess I think either will work. You just got to decide like how long you're in the game for. Is this something you want to do for the rest of your life? I think arguably we could have kept ditching suburbia. We're not in the suburbs. We live in town in a small town now. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's still a non-suburban lifestyle that we've gotten. We just felt like it was time to get out of that and kind of reassess where we were. But yeah, I think you could do both. It just kind of depends on what your goals are. The bigger question, and I think it's becoming an ever bigger question, is relates to kids and their ownership of themselves online. And I even questioned like how much we incorporated our own kids into our story and into our social media accounts and so forth. You know, what's going to happen when, you know, a kid that's grown up RVing turns 18 and says, you know what? I don't like myself on all these YouTube videos anymore. They need to come down. Do they have the right to ask for that? And if they do, like what happens to that whole family thing that they've got going? Mm. That's a tough question. 
And it I, is. Do you have an answer to that? I mean, I don't know. I what don't. The answer would be. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just ran across, there's like a TikTok lady who's, that's become her cause. And her opinion is that even at a young age, that should be the decision of the child. But you're like, they're not a, they're not an adult yet. So they don't get to make old decisions about their existence. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a tough, it's a tough nut to crack. But well, and even if the child decides, Hey, I do want to do this when they're six. And then they decide when they're 18 that they no longer, does that decision, like, do we give credence to the decision of a six-year-old? Right. At one point in time versus the 18 year old at yeah. a different point in time. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that we're definitely getting into that cycle of the kids that have started to grow up online are now hitting that adult age. And I think oh, yeah. like five to 10 years is when it's really going to be, we'll get yeah, those absolutely. things figured out for sure. You can look through the YouTube channels and there's some that are all about the kids and you can just plot out the, you know, the lifespan, like, all right, you can make bank for like five, six, seven, eight years. And then they're going to have one, they're going to need to have a say in it. So I know you can only speak from your perspective, but having gone through a significant amount of time traveling with your family, doing homeschooling and just seeing the country in that travel way, what's the opinion that your children have expressed to you of, did they enjoy it? Was it worth it? Would they do it again? I think they both would do it again. I actually asked them both. I was writing the book. I'm like, I can't write this book and not get input from you guys. So I need, give me some words. (laughs) Like, what do you think about it? So they're, my son's now 25 and my daughter will be 24 here pretty shortly looking back, like, what do you think about this whole thing? And both of them appreciated seeing what they saw and meeting the people that they met. A lot of the friends, a lot of people they still call friends came from those years on the road. My son wrote a little more than my daughter and he's now got a house with a girlfriend. He's like, I don't know how to be a neighbor to people that don't change every week. How do I build these relationships, longer term relationships than what we did while we were traveling? And it's, you know, it's a fair point. It's just, it's the different lifestyle that living in one house as versus living while you're mobile, but that's interesting. And that's definitely something, again, I think not looking a hundred percent down the road, there's a cost to everything right? by us traveling and giving our kids these awesome experiences of going to see things in real life versus just on the page of a book. You're also giving up something else. Yeah. We talked about opportunity cost all the time. Yeah. Is there anything else outside of the example of being a neighbor to someone who's there more than just four days that has come up of something that you had to give up as an opportunity? Well, I think just from a relationship point of view, he you know, misses the opportunity to have built longer term relationships with some mm-hmm. of the kids that he met while he was younger. And that's one of those things that's hard to know what would have happened if you didn't travel. Because a lot of those kids, they went in different mm-hmm. directions after a while too. And you can think back in your own life, you have these really strong friendships and then something changes and you realize that it's the lucky few that have lifelong friendships that manage to survive college and moves and different careers. So I, you know, I, I can't tell him he would have had great friends if we hadn't, right. if we hadn't traveled right. or better friendships, like it's a toss up mm-hmm. either way. I don't know for sure. So what's the goal of the book? Is it just to share memoirs of your, your experience on the road or where is there another objective of publishing this story? Yeah, I'm certainly not expecting to get rich from it. I mean, I would love it if it would just cover its own expenses at this point. That would be awesome. Because even though I did self-publish, but there are there was some overhead to that. My main goal is just to, like I said, just to com- present a complete experience to someone who is thinking about doing this. Let's talk a little bit about the actual writing of the book. You set a goal of doing a chapter a week. Did you have an outline of how many chapters you wanted to accomplish? And how did you come up with that outline? I initially said, when I get to 100, I'll get them into a book. And then I got to 100 and went, well, I still have more stories to tell. And then ultimately realized that it, I don't even know why I chose 100. It just seemed like a nice round number. There is a relationship to cost when you're self-publishing. The more pages you publish, the more expensive the book is going to be. And I think when it finally came down to the nuts and bolts of it, I didn't think it was going to affect the price that much to have just all of the 106 stories. And honestly, I couldn't find 26 to cut. <laughs> they they kind of became my own little children or collection of, mm-hmm. you know, they're all my favorite, really. And so to cut, oh, there's probably a couple that if I absolutely had to, like, yeah, I wouldn't suffer too bad if those were gone. But there's a lot of them, like, I, I just, I like that story and I want it to be in there. So it, it, I ended up just saying, okay, we're just going to, we're going to keep all 126 in there and we'll frame it out with what got us on the road and how, what got us off the road and how we think travel changed us. 
So it's it's been, I think it's about three years ago that I started writing the first content. So it's been a three-year process, two years of writing and then a year of aggregating and editing and pulling pictures in and getting permissions and just all of that. I think that's super important to hear. A release date for a book or a movie is a singular point in time, but it's often easy to overlook how long a project like that can actually take. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't set a release date for the first two years. Like, I don't know how long this is going to take. I have not done, I mean, I have published a book in the past, but it was a completely different book. Like, I don't know how long this is going to mm-hmm. take. Yeah, definitely. And being that it's kind of a passion project, I didn't want to, I didn't want to burn out again. I didn't want to get overly stressed trying to get mm-hmm. it out. Like I enjoy writing and I enjoy the process, but let's just take it. I, it's kind of, I don't watch TV. So it's that time of the day where you'd normally watch TV. So I work on it an hour in the morning and then work on it in the evening for another hour and a mm-hmm. half. Was it an easy decision to self-publish? Yeah, we did it the first time. I and mean, the first time we did it, it was a tech book and we did it out of necessity and it worked out in our favor. Like it really, you know, people in the tech industry say you don't publish a book to make money. You publish a book to establish yourself as an authority. So then you can turn around and make money consulting. And for us, the book made money. We wrapped up a major revision right before we started traveling. And I remember get, <laughs> trying to get ready to hit the road, trying to shop for the truck and the RV and finish that that book at the time. I actually, I felt so bad for my kids that like I have not had much time to give you guys attention. So I'm going to cut you in on the book. So every time the book sold, they each got 50 cents. And so that gave them kind of skin in the game. It, you know, as we were traveling, we'd get notified of sales and I'd let them know, hey, you just made another three, $4. But anyway, that experience, we just really appreciated it. And this time around, it was the same. I had a vision for what I wanted to publish. I didn't want to have to sell that vision to a publisher. I didn't want to have to negotiate it with an editor. I wanted to do it all and just have it be, you know, it's, it's, I didn't do the cover. I had to hire that out, but everything else, pretty much I did the design and the layout and then had a whole bunch of help for editing. Was there any difference in the two publishing experiences from your tech book to this book, you know, almost a decade later? Mainly, I think... It sounds weird to say because the tech book was full of code examples that if you were off by one character, the whole, it was about building a website using a content management system. If you left out one character, the whole site would not work. <laughs> but this one, it feels like we did way more editing. Like I, I counted at least 12 or 13 rounds of copy editing across three of us uh, to try to get it where we thought it was worth publishing. Who is publishing the book? Is it, are you using a service to print it out on demand or you, did you order a, a set amount of them and are shipping them from your home? We did it through Amazon's KDP program. So it's a print on demand. That's what we did the first time around. I really appreciated not having to have a, a box of books in my mm-hmm. garage doing bringing much down to the post office every week. I did not want to get into the fulfillment business. So we did that same thing again this time around. Was there any difference in that 10 years apart? It's a pretty straightforward. You just fill in the blanks. Yeah, pretty much. And I think the first time it was Create Space, and Amazon has since purchased that and kind of incorporated all that into their KDP program. Uh, so the interface is probably a little slicker than what I remember. I don't have a strong mm-hmm. memory of what the first time around was. I think there's more options now for trim sizes and color. So this is full color. Amazon has two color options. This is called standard color. And then they have, also have like full photographic color. The cost of the full photographic color was just over the top. There's no way I would sell any. But this is, uh, I'm I'm pretty happy with the quality. I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I think it's a good looking book. The pictures look good. I didn't have to go back and, and change any pictures out because they printed too dark or anything. Like every picture I put in there has come out in an acceptable fashion. Looking back over the last three years of writing and editing this book, what was the hardest part? I actually have a video production degree and for a short time did video work. And I learned that you never ever, you never use a song that you really like in a music video that you have to edit because by the time the video is done, you've heard that song about 2000 times and you get really, really sick of it. We got to the point with some of these stories is like, I've read this thing like 12 times. Um, I still call them my favorites, but we got to a point where it's like, I just don't want to read this thing again. <laughs> You know, it's like you think you know something about punctuation and hyphenation and, oh, we did more Google searches for, you know, what words are hyphenated and proper capitalization and, and all of that. It's, it was just crazy. Do you think you would go back and do all the self-editing again? Yeah, I would. Cause I just, I mean, I like, I like owning it and, and as much as I can. So there's part of me too, that, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer by trade at work. I have a remote job now for a corporation, a software uh, integration house where I'm a managing editor. So this is a bit of a resume piece for me at this point. If anyone asks, you know, can you, can you write, can you edit? Like what, what kind of quality can you put out? I would hand them this. 
That's really cool. Double-edged sword of getting the story out, but also having it be a piece for your resume as well. Right. What did you decide to do in terms of marketing this book? You said if it could pay for itself, that's what you're looking for and also using it as a resume builder. But obviously you want it to succeed. You know, jumping on podcasts like this is one way to, to reach people, but what other ways are you choosing to do that? Say you this book had come out and you were still doing Ditching in Suburbia and had your family brand, you'd have a built-in audience right there. Like Alyssa just released her book. She's got the whole Heath and Alyssa and the RV Amish right. community that she can release this book to, to get an inflush of people off on the offset of the publishing to, to get that yep. boost. What ways did you decide to market this book and are you going to continue marketing the book? So it's funny. That's what, that was actually our plan with Ditching Suburbia. And that's why we were trying so hard to get the website and our social reaches, you know, increase as much as possible. So that when I finally get the book done, we would have that audience sitting there waiting for it. You know, trouble is I burned out and the book never happened. <laughs> so this time around, and, and there's a part of me that doesn't like to sell, like I didn't hype this much for a long time because, you know, it's an, it's an attention economy. You know, you go on LinkedIn, you go on any social feed and people will, you know, stay tuned because we got this cool thing we're going to tell you about next week. And I'm like, I'm not going to remember who you are next week. So for me, it was like, I'm going to wait until I, this thing is almost done before I even really start talking about it publicly because I don't want to, I don't like selling air. Like I want to wait till I, I know I'm going to have a product out there to sell. So that comes at a cost of not having a big audience waiting for it. So the pickle I'm in now, and it's one that I'm still working through how to solve is, you know, we, while we were traveling, we knew a lot of, you know, a lot of the currently popular, like full-time travel influencers we know and we met them while we were on the road but it's been a couple of years and i haven't stayed in contact with them so it's weird now to go back to somebody i considered a friend like five years ago going hey hey i know you haven't heard from me but i got a book would you help me sell it it's hard for me to do that i'm not a i'm not a natural born salesman that way so i've got to figure out how to how to bridge that gap because it i think the only real way to get this thing successful is to get it in the hands of some mm -hmm. social influencers yeah that is definitely an, an interesting Dilemma for sure, because I think as much as, especially the RV lifestyle and the travel lifestyle, I've heard someone describe it as it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And there's going to be some of those relationships that you made on the road that are going to be those highest of highs that you're going to continue having on. And there's going to be some folks that you just, you know, you're in the same place doing the same thing and you had a connection there and the connection didn't last past that. And that's okay, except that now it would be nice to have right. that to, to right. push it out. And yeah, that's definitely a, a conundrum to, to figure out for sure. I think you're doing a good step of getting on here and talking on the podcast. And, you know, if, folks, if you uh, you met Michael and, and the Boinks, reach back out to him because this, uh, this book sounds like it's a labor of love and it uh, has been edited and re-edited to the point of near perfection. Well, and the other thing I want to make a point about the book too, is it's, it's not a, um, it's not a leader for something else. Like it, I'm not trying to really sell you a mastermind course or, you know, some kind of a membership plan. And I know people do that and that's fine. This, this is not a hook to try to get you into something else. It's a book mm -hmm. and nothing more than a book. <laughs> so if you're looking forward, what does success look like with the book launching? Is there a certain number of copies you'd like to sell? Is there a certain number of responses from readers you'd like to receive, you know, five, 10 years down the road, what makes it successful? I guess if people are still buying it at that point. So if, if it has stayed relevant that long in this age of things, you know, having a lifespan of, you know, what, nine months or 18 months, you know, I'm, I'm flipping through it now as we're talking and that, you know, these, these stories as I've written them are not, I, I think they can be called timeless. I mean, sure. Some of the attractions we talk about may change hands or websites may change. There, there will certainly be some stuff that changes out over time, but you know, stories of overcoming fears and stories of, you know, things that happen to you on the road. You know, I, I go back, one of the people I, I really appreciate is Charles Kuralt. Are you feeling familiar with Charles? I am not. Charles Kuralt was a CBS reporter and then a CBS anchor. And then he started what you would now call the granddaddy of all travel vlogging shows. He, he had a show called On the Road. And he traveled in a, in, he was in a class A, it was, I think it was an FMC motorhome. There's actually, there's one of his motorhomes in the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan, if anyone ever goes there. And I think he did it for like eight or 10 years. He traveled, it was film, it was pre-video. So he traveled with a film guy and a sound guy. And they just, they, they traveled the 
back country roads of America and they looked for stories. One of his famous ones, they drove by a yard that had a, a sign. I think, I think the Vietnam vets were coming home or, or Korean war vets were coming home. And one, you know, a veteran was coming home, welcome home. So, and so so they, they backed up the motor home and they went and they, they interviewed his family and they, they met him when he came home from the war. He interviewed, you know, he found a guy who was building bikes from junk bikes and giving away to, to impoverished kids. And he would, he would interview that guy and feature his story. So he, he traveled he was an RVer, but it was his efforts were to tell other people's stories because he was a journalist. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't the, the camera was not pointed at himself, saying, "Here I am," in, you know, Mississippi. Yeah, he was on camera, but it wasn't about him. It was about the people he was meeting. Those were the kind of things I was keeping in mind while writing this. Now, obviously, a lot of this is still about the Boinks and about what the Boinks did, but there are a fair number of stories about the people that we met that I, I wanted to get in there as well. How do you go about writing a book with that intention of evergreen, timeless stories, making it so that it reads as much as possible as a timeless story? So, you know, not having a ton of social pop references of this website or this social media platform, but making it general enough to appeal to someone 25 years down the road, while also being specific enough to tell the story. How do you go about writing it that way and then also editing it for that intention? Yeah, I guess a lot of it is just kind of human interest stories. And it's um, whether it's about somebody else or about about us, you know, about growing and being challenged and changing because of an experience. And that hasn't changed. It still happens to us, just the, the means by which it happens has changed. Again, I'm flipping through trying to get trying to get thoughts here, but yeah, it's not actually there is there's a fair number of I'm a huge music fan and we met some musicians and stuff. So there there are some references in here that would anchor it to a certain period in history for sure but the flip side is we you know we learned stories from history that we never learned in school and just found fascinating so those a few of those have percolated into the book as well but i think just the more you write about people and how people change and grow and learn rather than you know the tools and the you know the online world probably keeps it a little a little more timeless so it's really cool. We're getting, you said, class of 2018. We're getting folks that are going through the season of life and the cycle of full-time traveling and then figuring out that they need to take a break or do something else. How did you guys decide where you were going to land after you got off the road? Yeah, it's funny. We um, So we're in southwest Missouri, a little town called Ava. We're about an hour-ish from Branson. And we're about an hour-ish from Springfield. And that's the question we get most asked around town. Like, Why did you guys end up here? We're kind of, uh, it's, it's an hour to anything and we're in the middle of the Ozarks. It's kind of a, an isolated little town. You have to purpose to come here, basically. Through my whole sabbatical experience, we've met people from Ava and they uh, step back a little bit. So we're Christians. Part of our being on the road was growing in our faith, also getting challenged in our faith, also kind of refactoring how we wanted to live out our faith. And so we met people from here who were living in community in a way that we hadn't lived in before. So they, they have um, a, a, they have 80 acres, 80 to a hundred acres kind of outside of town. They have a shared church. They have a shared homeschool and they eat together three times a week. Um, and they're just much more involved in each other's lives. It sounds a little like a hippie commune when I, when I describe it, but <laughs> it's, and when we came out here, I was like, as I met them and um, and worked with them, I was kind of watching for signs of weirdness, but they're just generally good people who are trying to live in a closer way, uh, a more biblical way than, than you might in mainstream America. So they, they said, come out, like, we'll house you rent free, just kind of give you a place to land for a while and figure life out. And if it's two months, that's great. If it's longer, that's great. And we'll, you know, we'll house you and feed you and, and just, again, give you, give you space to uh, figure life out. So we did, we came out, we were in a little class B van at that point and we, we parked it on the property there. And then we ended up moving in. One of them had a, kind of the whole end of a house that was not being used. So we had, we had a bedroom and bathroom and a living, living space all to ourselves. And uh, I ended up getting a job in town that there was still a local newspaper, a weekly newspaper yet that was looking for an editor. So I ended up taking the, the editor job at the newspaper Eventually, my wife joined me as a sales manager. So a couple of the years between our road travels and now, we, we ran the little local weekly newspaper. That's super cool. And I think, sure, maybe it sounds a little bit like a hippie commune, but I also think <laughs> that that type of community 
is what a majority of people are getting on the road to find. Yeah, I would agree. And, and we and we actually built those kind of things in a temporary fashion. We had a, a couple of experiences where a number of us, we all scheduled to be at the same park for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of us coming from, you know, background of faith of some kind. And it turned, in, it turned into a little, you know, community church experience. Yeah. I find it hard to believe that someone who could take their family on the road for eight years and travel extensively like that could just turn it off permanently. Are you guys continuing to travel in <laughs> any sort of fashion? Yeah. So what happened was while we were at the newspapers are not conducive to travel. We learned that in a, in a big hurry. Um, there's definitely a weekly publishing cycle. You, you no sooner get one issue out than you immediately start building the next one. More likely you're going to be coming in to cover something happening on Saturday, especially in a small town. So much happens on the weekend. You got to come in to cover the you know 4th of July parade or school graduation or whatever. And being, you know, adding on top of that, being kind of in this remote little community, I mean, there were weeks, months even that went by and I never went out of town. And so even just to drive over to Springfield for anything was a big deal. And yeah, it, it kind of, it was okay for a while. And I'm like, man, I'm getting itchy feet again. So we, we kind of like, well, what can we do with the constraints that we have? So I, I ended up buying a little minivan, little Toyota minivan. I'm like, let's just build a little weekender camper van. So we stripped out the seats, built a platform bed a little, you know, kitchen set up with a cooler. Uh, and I built it to sustain us for three nights. So if we get a long weekend, you know, this can sustain us for three nights. And the, the hope was that we could just go to, you know, state park or conservation area and uh, just, you know, at least get away for weekend kind of camping experiences. Just about the time I've you know, got the van sort of set up, uh, the newspaper sold. So we started working there. It was the third generation owner and she decided to retire. She sold the newspaper we just, we really didn't see eye to eye with a new owner. So I, I started looking for a, a new job and that was all kind of just right before COVID hit, I think maybe six months before, but the whole remote work industry had grown quite a bit in the past couple of years. So I was able to find this new job, which is remote job. So now we're kind of pushing that three, you know, that weekend or camper van, we're pushing it for a week long trips and a little more. So we've, we've added some more things to it. I don't have house electric yet. That's kind of the next step is um, switching to some kind of a rechargeable battery situation so we can power a 12 volt fridge and stop buying ice every, every three days Mm -hmm. and then maybe solar down the road. I don't know. But you know, I've, I've gone to look at RVs again and like, Oh, I just don't know if I want to do that. You know, prices are, gosh, they're, they feel like they're double than when we bought. And it's not just a pricing thing. I mean, our gas aside, that's a huge concern right now too, but we just, even while we were on the road, we, we tried to not repeat experiences. You know, we, we were doing this to have new experiences and I'm kind of still in that mode. I don't know if we would get back in the RV world again, or if we did it, there would have to be a purpose to it. So whether, you know, that's traveling and volunteering at missions or something, I don't know. There would have to be more to it than just, you know, the boinks want to, you know, go on long road trips again. Mm-hmm. There's a caretaking industry. I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, there's a caretaker gazette that's been publishing for decades, I think, but they, it's the latest jobs where there's places where they, they it's kind of like work camping, you know, maybe it's a bed and breakfast. I need someone that wants to live on site and kind of run the business or there's uh, there's people that own multiple properties and they just want someone to live there to have somebody on site for security reasons, house sitting, long-term house sitting gigs, those kind of things. We're, we don't know what we want to do yet, but we're just kind of eyeing those options going you know, we've got a little house in town here. We we bought it right before real estate blew up, so we got it super cheap. We've fixed up a bunch of it. It needs a little bit of work yet, but as we've been fixing it up, we we keep thinking of it as a future rental because we just don't know. So I'm not going to invest a ton of money into this. I mean, it's a small little house anyway. I wouldn't dump a ton of money into it, but just as we fix it up, I'm like, yeah, let's let's just treat it like a rental because who knows a couple of years from now we may just you know rent it out and go do something else but we just we don't know what that something else is we're just kind of evaluating options yeah well i definitely think you're at a precipice of of good fortune in so much as things are coming together where you could continue to do your remote job from that little minivan wherever you are with certain internet connectivity and yeah. the rise of short term rentals with airbnb you know, you could even do that too, of not even committing yep. to year long rental to somebody to come live in the house. But hey, you know, we're an hour outside of Branson, come stay here for a weekend and just do the, the short term rental thing. And then, you know, book it to yourself when you want to come back home and have right. some time off the road or not be caretakers. You're now set up to be able to take advantage of those opportunities, which is a blessing and a curse 
because now <laughs> you have all those options. Right. You know, the, the answers get more eloquent the more constraints you have on a system. Well, you're removing constraints by giving flexibility, so that makes it a bit more complicated because now you have to make a decision. But yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, we'd actually looked at becoming reverse snowbirds. So Missouri, we love it most of the time, but last summer was just hot and muggy for a really long time. And I, I'm much more tolerant of cold temperatures than I am of hot and muggy. So I'm like, can we get out of here for the summer this year? You know, and look in maybe Upper Peninsula of Michigan or Minnesota and just go find like a student rental place that, you know, they aren't going to be there for the summer. I don't know. We, mm-hmm. we ended up, there's house projects that kind of kept us here. We didn't chase that down, but yeah, to, to try to find a rental for like three months or four months that's furnished, that's not like, you know, $2,000 or $3,000 a month is mm-hmm. it's an interesting puzzle. Yeah, for sure. Well, give us a rundown again, the title of the book. The title of the book is Driven to Wonder, and that's Wonder with an O. And I get people asking, you know, shouldn't that be Driven to Wander? And you know, it's very intentionally Wonder. The reason I like this title and the reason I chose it was it's a little Rubik's Cube. So there's, there's two meanings for the word driven and there's two meanings for the word wonder. Mm. And no matter how you combine them, the title makes sense. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And where is the best place for folks to go find more about the book and, and download it or buy it? Uh, it's available on Amazon. So if you search for that on Amazon or if you go to driven to wonder.com, that'll, that'll bring you through to my website that has the Amazon links. And there's, there's uh, sample chapters and kind of outlines of what's in the book. The main thing I want people to understand before they buy this is that this is not an RVing how-to book. This is not tips and tricks. This is not hacks. This is not, you know, how to manage your waste tanks and, you know, how to how to manage your air conditioning units. It's stories that are enabled because we were in an RV. They're not specifically always stories about the RV. Yes, there is. Mm-hmm. There are some RV-specific stories in here. We got, you know, in some situations that were interesting to get out of. <laughs> But it is, it is not a how-to guide. I call it a why-to. So if you're thinking about hitting the road full-time in an RV and you think more about why would I do that and what's going to happen to us and is it going to kill my family or my kids going to hate me, if, if those kind of questions are more in your mind than the how-tos, then this is the book for you. That's very cool. I love that. And I love how the, the title can be taken multiple ways. Yeah. Awesome. Michael, thank you for joining us on the RV Entrepreneur Podcast. Guys, if you're interested in checking out Driven to Wonder by Michael Boink, We'll put all the links to that in the show notes as well. Hopefully uh, you guys can get out and do a little bit of longer stuff in your Toyota minivan and uh, yeah. find find out the things that you're interested in and, and continue to build your life around the way that supports that. Again, thank you from someone who's starting out on this cycle and this season of life <laughs> yeah. for looking retrospectively and publishing the entire circle. What can we look forward to 8, 10, 12 years down the road? Right. I know it's only your experience and your family, but it's helpful to have case studies. And I know it's been three years in the making of getting this perspective out there, but it's very much appreciated. Right. So thank you for the book. And also thank you for the time jumping on the podcast with me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Michael. I actually recall reading Ditching Suburbia years ago and thought, wow, this is really cool. Who knows? I really can't pin down where we decided RV travel was going to be the thing after Coley retired from the Air Force, but maybe Ditching Suburbia had a part to play in that story. I really enjoyed that Michael has a full circle picture. I think his time frame of four to five years for a full-time family, as a general rule for families, it seems to be the case of what I've witnessed as well, is is folks get on the road and they do four to five years of full-time travel if they're doing more than just the summer road trip. And then they move on to something else, whether it be boat life or homesteading, you know, moving on to another season and chapter in life. But I'd love to hear your opinion. Do you think that the four to five year time frame is accurate? Jump over to the RV Entrepreneur Facebook group and let us know. And if you'd like to connect with us on any of the other social platforms, go to the RVEntrepreneur.com slash connect. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, RVEntrepreneur.com slash guest form is the place to do that. Until next time in the next episode, I'll see you on the road. Take care and happy trails.